Hello goons and gals, I welcome you to today's video on the best middleweight adventure bikes to buy in 2022. Now before I put this list together, I ask myself a very pressing question. How does little old me, born a goon, with a small subscriber base, stand out in the cesspool of redundant and cheesy adventure bike topless videos scouring YouTube? How does one educate you on the right motorcycle to buy, but yet make it entertaining? Well, that's a tough order, but I do think I have a solution. You see, most of the time a video like this is just some goon like myself that's narrating specs off of a spec sheet. Now, while that could be good, the problem with specs is that they are just speculative. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, they might not be accurate, as manufacturers have been known to skew things like horsepower and weight numbers. And two, what is written on paper and how a bike works as a whole can be two different things. What makes a great motorcycle is not a great spec sheet, but a motorcycle that works as a whole. You see, a brutally powerful, high horsepower motorcycle may sound awesome, but if it has a crappy chassis and a bad suspension, you might not be able to use that horsepower properly. Whereas something like a smaller displacement bike or a lower horsepower bike may sound underwhelming on the spec sheet, but if the bike is built right, it may have the most usable horsepower in the group and thus be more exciting to ride. Now, most of this always comes down to selecting the right bike for your intended riding style, your riding ability and purpose. I've been fortunate enough to ride most of the motorcycles I'm featuring today on this list. Some I've ridden extensively, where others I've just ridden briefly. Nonetheless, I do have enough experience in the motorcycle world to gauge the purpose and potential of a motorcycle, so I will tell you in today's list what I liked and what I disliked about the ones that I have ridden, along with the type of rider the bike is most suited for. The other topic I must discuss is what is actually a middleweight adventure bike, or at least the criteria that I'm putting for today's middleweight adventure bike list. You see, adventure bikes used to be big, bulky Starbucks transporters that were status symbols for the less than average rider who had great financial skills that could afford the lofty price tag. That was until the middleweight adventure space took off that featured affordable, lightweight, usable bikes. Well, at least that was the thinking. I mean, you could still argue today that they're very expensive, they're still overweight and challenging to ride. But nonetheless, the purpose for middleweight adventure bikes was to be light and nimble. And you know everybody likes a good middleweight. So for today's list, we're gonna focus on two different types of criteria to define what a middleweight adventure bike is. And the first of those criteria is going to be the engine size. For today's list, we're only gonna be talking about those motorcycles between 800 cc's and 1,000 cc's. Now I do understand that the closer we get to 1,000 cc's, we're pushing the envelope on what a real true middleweight adventure bike can be. But for the sake of this list, that's what we're gonna go with. That's also gonna leave out some real strong staple adventure bikes that are very popular amongst riders out there, such as the KLR 650, the Honda 300 Rally, the Versys 300, plus a host of others that I may have forgot. Now the second criteria is we're only gonna focus on those as well with a 21 inch front tire. And that's gonna leave out some really sweet adventure bikes like the Versi 650, the V-Strom 650, or even the new Moto Guzzi V85. Now, despite my best attempt to add caveats and be as forthcoming as I can about this list, I'm sure I'm still going to upset some people with my personal opinions. But let's get started anyway. <laughs> Now we'll start out with the bikes that I have actually ridden and in no particular order I'm going to begin with the KTM 890 Adventure R. The most impressive thing about the KTM 890 Adventure R is its suspension system. The very best, hands down, no questions asked, out of the box stock suspension of any adventure bike that's sold today, period. What else I like is the low saddlebag fuel tanks. Now this serves two functions. The first is it keeps the weight low on the bike, making it easier to maneuver through technical terrain, and it makes that suspension system that much better. You'll notice that many of the bikes that we talk about today on this list are gonna carry their weight up high, and when you're talking about a 450 to 500 pound motorcycle, that can make it much more challenging in certain situations to ride. So KTM has done a good job by keeping that weight low making this bike nice and nimble. The other thing is they act as some sort of crash protection. 
Now, many of these adventure bikes that you buy today, you'll have to spend three to $500 extra in crash bars to protect your engine components. These saddlebag fuel tanks act as an engine protection. Now, they may look plastic or they may look cheesy, but I haven't seen any reports of these breaking when they hit rocks or smashing against trees. They're very, very durable, and KTM claims that they will not break, and I haven't seen any reports of that happening yet. The KTM 890R comes with tubeless tires, which in my opinion makes it a lot easier to change punctures. The engine is superior to any in its class. This is a motorcycle that loves to be ridden and loves to be ridden hard. It also has a plastic or fiberglass body, which should be more durable in accidents, plus easier to replace if you do any damage to it. It has a comprehensive electronics package with traction control, cruise control, and a host of other electronics and rider modes. The weight is one of the lowest in its class, and I felt that the ergonomics of the bike fit me pretty well, and I'm about 5'8". And I think those ergonomics would fit all of those riders that are anywhere between that 5'8 and 6 feet 2. But there are some things I didn't like about the KTM 890 Adventure R. And one of those was the fit and finish. It looked like the bike was just thrown together at the last minute. Now I'm not here to bash on any motorcycle because I haven't owned this bike as a long-term motorcycle. Some of the problems widely mentioned include rear shock failure, counter shaft sprocket leaks, condensation in the TFT display, loose bolts, and cold starting issues. This may not be the case for every KTM rider. It's hit and miss sometimes when it comes to this bike. Now much of this isn't an overall long-term problem with the bike, but when you're spending an average of fifteen dollars to $16,000 out the door, maybe that's something that you don't want to deal with. Next on our list is the Yamaha Tenere 700, which is probably the most popular middleweight adventure bike that is sold today. And the reason that the Yamaha is so popular is because of its single greatest asset, which happens to be its price tag of just 10,000 United States dollars. Now there are many other great qualities that the Tenere has, which I'll talk about here in just a second. But if you're one of those riders who is seeking maximum value, it is impossible to find anything else on this list that packs this much value and can do it at that price. And because of the Tenere's performance along with its value, there simply isn't another competitor in its class. Now the price tag isn't the only thing I liked about this bike. I also like the smooth, usable engine. Now while it doesn't put out the horsepower numbers or has that fly by the seat of your pants thrill that the KTM 890 Adventure R gives you, the power that the Tenere has is all usable. It has this nice, smooth, linear, tractable power that I would find fits more riders than say the KTM 890 Adventure R. I also like the anti-squat chassis design. This is a great feature for those that are riding more off-road. The exterior is much like the KTM 890 Adventure R where it is plastic, so the bike has sort of a bomb-proof exterior. And as we all know with Japanese motorcycles, they're hard to beat when it comes to reliability. Now the thing that some riders may not like, which wasn't a downfall for me, is that it doesn't have any electronics. Now to me personally, this was not a problem because I felt the way that the bike worked, it didn't need it. And for many riders out there, they don't want these electronics on their bike. To them, that's one less problem they have to worry about, and I understand that. All the Yamaha comes with is switchable on and off ABS. But again, that's rider specific as to whether that's a problem for you or not. Also, I found the Yamaha Tenere to carry a lot of its weight up top and towards the front. If you look at the design of the motorcycle, you'll see that the engine is very high along with the gas tank. This seemed to give me a feeling that the bike was carrying a little bit more weight to the front. Now, while this wasn't a serious problem while riding, if you find yourself in muddy or loamy conditions, you might have to work a little bit harder to get this bike to maneuver through those situations than say the KTM 890 Adventure R. Now, in order to get a motorcycle to be sold with this much quality at this much value, corners have to be cut somewhere. And I felt that the Yamaha did skimp in some certain areas, which to me is not a deal breaker, but you should be aware of them if you're already not. One is that the TFT display rattles when you get over 50 miles per hour. Two, the turn signals look like they were found out of a 1980s parts bin. And the suspension system to me was very wallowy and incredibly soft, and I don't weigh that much. So for most riders, they're gonna have to address that issue. 
All in all, like I said earlier, it's impossible to beat this value along with the reliability that you're getting with Yamaha at this price tag. That's why you'll find that this bike is almost virtually sold out at every dealership and they're almost impossible to find used because owners simply don't want to sell their Tenere's and that speaks volumes to what this bike really is. Next on the list is the Triumph Tiger 900, which I have finally had the chance to ride recently. Now, most of you know who follow this channel, I love Triumph motorcycles. In fact, it is a Tiger 800, which I still have, that gave birth to this Bornagoon channel. So this one's gonna be real easy for me because basically the 900 Rally Pro builds on all of the great things that the Tiger 800 has and does it so much better. And the first thing that I like about this is the first thing I like about the Tiger 800 I currently own, and that is the engine. And it's not just the power of the engine or the silky smooth delivery of that power, it's that sound. <laughs> to me is just nothing else that sounds as sexy and as smooth as a three-cylinder Triumph engine. And man, this 900 just knows how to purr. Now, because it's a three-cylinder engine, it performs and needs to be ridden much different than the V-Twins. And I certainly could understand the argument that a V-Twin is probably a better engine off-road because of its torque, but there's just something special about riding a Triumph. Ask any Triumph owner, I don't know what it is. It's just that way. So my favorite thing is that 900 motor. They've done such a great job in the advancement over the 800cc power plant that came with the generation before. Also, the looks. I like how they've retained some of the older styling of the previous generation Tigers while giving that updated, fresh look. It has an easy to use, very stylish TFT display. The fit and finish of a Triumph is almost second to none. You have tubeless tires like you do on the KTM 890 Adventure R. And the Rally Pro comes with a lot of amenities that these other bikes don't have, such as heated grips, heated seats, cruise control, and many other premium features like that. So on that note, that's what I like most about the 900, which is pretty much what I liked about my 800 and they've done a great job on building on that platform. One of the, my main complaints about the Tiger 800, which is transferred to the 900, is this metal gas tank. If you look at the shape of the gas tank, it points outwards. Now, while this adds to its sexy European styling, those have a tendency to hit the ground before your crash bars. They also have a tendency to scrape up against anything if you're doing any tight technical trails. Now, not every Triumph Tiger owner is going to intend to take it off a serious single track off-roading, but if you are going to do any off-roading at all, be aware that this tank is sort of a dent waiting to happen. Also, the Tiger 900 carries its weight heavy. Now they've done a great job in fixing the rake and trail over the current generation of the Tiger 800, but that presence is still there where you feel that heavier weight, where the bike feels like the front is pushing. And probably my biggest disappointment with the Triumph Tiger 900 Rally Pro is the price tag of 17,500 United States dollars. Now I know you have an incredible amount of fit and finish. The reliability of this bike is amazing and it comes out of the box with a lot of great premium features. I feel like that $17,500 price tag is a little bit steep. I mean, you could almost buy two Yamaha Tenere's for that price. To me, I wish the bike was about $1,000 less, but that's the way it goes. Next up, I'm going to talk about the motorcycles I haven't had the privilege of riding. And before I do that, I just want you to take everything I say here with a grain of salt because it's simply just my opinion. Without me ever owning one of these bikes, without me ever riding one of these bikes, I can't give you a true accurate assessment of how they really perform in a real world environment. All I'm doing here is just giving you my opinion and I could totally be wrong on this. First up is the BMW 850 GS. Now I personally have never been a fan of BMW motorcycles. Now I don't mean to throw shade on you BMW fanatics. I was once not a fan of Triumph motorcycles either until I bought one. So perhaps if I bought a BMW, I would become a loyal BMW owner by a whole fleet of them 
them and fall in love with the brand forever. Unfortunately, I've never had the chance to ride one. My main beef here with the BMW 850 GS, while I know that BMW the brand itself is iconic in the world of adventure motorcycling, is that this middleweight segment has gotten so competitive that for the price of a BMW 850, I feel there are more bikes with better technology, better components, better quality, and better options that are available to you now. And they simply have not kept up with the other brands. I also haven't had a chance to ride the new Husqvarna Nord 901. Now while I like the old world charm, I recently did a video by saying who owns Husqvarna motorcycles, KTM. So many of the features that are available on the KTM 890 Adventure R and the components are the same ones that are used on the Norden 901. Now while the Norden versions of these bikes were used to tame down the 890 Adventure R and make it more tour oriented, many of the early complaints about the Norden 901 are the same complaints we've seen about the 890 Adventure R. The leaky counter shaft sprocket, blown shocks, condensation in the TFT display, so it seems like they've not just brought over the great features of the 890R, but they've also brought some of the bad ones. Now, even though I haven't ridden this one, I would expect it to perform very close to the KTM 890 Adventure R, meaning it will be powerful, it will be strong, it will be capable, but you'll have to deal with some of the downsides that comes with owning this brand. The next up is the Ducati Desert X. Now, I'm really excited one day to get the opportunity to ride this bike. I love the way it looks. I love some of the current feedback I'm hearing out there on the internet about this bike. Now, I've owned a few Ducatis in the past and I've never had any reliability issues with them. And I don't consider Ducatis to be the type of money pit that they used to be back in, let's say, the early 1990s. However, the bike is a little bit pricey, pushing almost $17,000. Now, there's two ways to look at that. One, $17,000 is a lot. Two, there's a lot of other bikes that are on this list that are pushing close to 17,000 as well. So you're spending that kind of money in this segment. The next is the one I'm the most excited to get my hands on, and that is the all new Aprilia Touareg 660. This is the closest competitor that we have to the Yamaha Tenere 700. These two bikes are very similar in numbers, but the Touareg actually comes with a full electronics package. I think this is going to be an amazing motor motorcycle for Aprilia. It's going to be a hit and I would love to ride one. So in a wrap up, which one of these bikes would I buy? If I could only own one of these motorcycles on the list, it would probably still be the KTM 890 Adventure R. And the reason I would choose this bike is because of my style of riding. I'm somebody that likes to be aggressive on an adventure bike. I like to do a lot of off-road riding, and I think it's the most complete bike out of the box. And I'd be willing to put up with some of the KTM's reported issues in exchange for its incredible performance. The second bike I would choose would be the Aprilia Touareg. I also really like the looks, which I didn't mention earlier. I think it has some clean lines. The more I look at this bike, the more I read about this bike, the more I want to own an Aprilia Touareg. And last would be the tried and true Yamaha Tenere. And probably the only thing that's keeping it third on my list is that I just can't find one to buy. For the rest of them, I wouldn't mind owning any of the bikes on this list, but those would be my top three. So goons and gals, that's it for today's list. Now you heard what my top three are. I'd like to hear what your opinions are. What are the bikes that you are currently looking at? What are your favorites? Which one of these would you buy if you could only own one? And did I leave any of the motorcycles out? As always, everything I discussed in today's video is just my opinion, and I could be wrong.